Hi, Nantara. Hi. So we uh, the webinar is live now and we have participants joining in. Okay. And we will start in another two minutes. All right, sure. Okay. Okay. Hi, Nantara. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you, Sunana. How's it going? Good, good. Good to see you. You too. Hi, Sunana. Hi, Puja. Hi, Rajesh. Hi. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good to I'm see good. you. I'm good. How about you? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Sorry. I was got stuck in another call. No, no. You're right on time. Don't worry. You're just letting participants in right now. Okay. Yeah, we'll start in about a minute. Sure. <clears throat> All right. Good evening, everyone. I, Pooja Mathur, on behalf of CSR Box and the Habitats Trust, welcome you all to the penultimate virtual symposium of this year's grant cycle by the Habitats Trust. Thank you for joining us today. As partner and co-host with the Habitats Trust, we, con we conducted four Pan-India virtual symposiums, including this one, in an effort to bring together individuals, organizations, researchers, and <laughs> policymakers on one platform such that they can deliberate upon how individuals and organizations can contribute towards conservation of sustainable ecosystems. With the dual objectives, we intend to stir discussion regarding the protection and conservation of India's lesser known natural habitats and indigenous species of flora and fauna, as well as to inform individuals and organizations about the Habitat Trust grants and its application process. We hope you will find the program we have lined up for you to be fruitful and engaging. To begin, please join me in welcoming Sunaina Malik, Grants Manager at the Habitats Trust, to help us with an overview of the grants, the eligibility, the eva evaluation criteria, and the selection process for all the four grant categories. Sunaina, over to you. Thank you, Pooja. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Sunaina from the Habitats Trust Grants team. To begin with, I would like to give you a brief overview about the Habitats Trust and then run you through the details about our flagship program, the Habitats Trust Grants. Next. The Habitats Trust was founded three years ago in 2018 by Roshni Nadar Malhotra, the chairperson of HCL Technologies and Chikan Malhotra, the executive director and board member of HCL Corporation, who are both extremely passionate about wildlife and conservation. The aim of the Habitats Trust is to protect India's natural habitats and its indigenous species by establishing strategic partnerships, by focusing on on-ground efforts, 
by engaging technology for conservation and through conservation awareness generation. We aim to provide support and recognition to passionate grassroots conservationists across the country and work towards innovative, sustainable and replicable conservation initiatives on ground to secure our habitats and species. The mission of the Habitats Trust is to create and conserve sustainable ecosystems across India through strategic partnerships and collaborations with all stakeholders at every level. Next. Now coming to our flagship program, the Habitats Trust Grants. In this presentation, I will run you through an overview about the grants, our past recipients, the eligibility criteria, and the evaluation process. Next. The Habitats Trust Grants were also initiated in 2018 with a aim to recognize and support organizations and individuals working tirelessly in the field to protect our natural habitats and indigenous species of flora and fauna. Under the grants program, we invite applications in four categories, three for organizations and one for individuals. For organizations, we have the Strategic Partnership Grant amounting to 35 lakhs, the Lesser Known Habitats Grant for 30 lakhs, and the Lesser Known Species Grant for 25 lakhs. For individuals, we have the Conservation Hero Grant amount for 15 lakh rupees. Over the years, we have increased the grant values as well. Also, this year onwards, the grants will be administered over a duration of two years instead of one. We felt that this would help us in increasing the conservation impact of our projects on ground. I would also like to mention that towards the end of our grant application process, two finalists in each category are awarded 10% of the category grant value to support their conservation efforts. Next. As you can see on this slide, the Habitat Trust grants are getting more and more competitive with an increased number of proposals being received every year. In 2020, we received the highest number of registrations and applications at 4,311 and 561 respectively. Next. In this slide, you can see our presence in different parts of the country. I would like to mention that the largest number of applications received under the grants came from the Northeast region of India, the Western Ghats and parts of Southern India. And this is reflected in our active projects as well, as you can see on the map. Our strategic partnership grant partners are denoted in a dark blue color. Towards the West, we have the Corbett Foundation working in Abdasa, Greater Run of Kutch. In the Northeast, we have Aranyak working in Mandas National Park in Assam and Foundation for Ecological Security in Nagaland. Our lesser known habitats partner are denoted by the green color on the map. In Tamil Nadu, we have Seeds Trust working in the Ayrlul habitat. Towards the West in Goa, we have Coastal Impact and Reef Watch Marine Conservation have their project based out of Andaman Islands. Our lesser known species partner are denoted by the orangish color on the map. The Bad Conservation India Trust works in Kola district in Karnataka. The Metastring Foundation works in different parts of the Western Ghats, whereas Sayadri Nisarg Mitra have been working in the Konkan region of Western Ghats. In yellow, we have our conservation hero grant partners, M. Suraj working in Chhattisgarh and Niti Mahesh in the Kur district in Karnataka. Next. In its first edition in 2018, the Habitats Trust Grants awarded a total of 50 lakhs to organizations working to protect India's biodiversity. A strategic uh, partnership grant recipient, Foundation for Ecological Security, has been working to strengthen governance and management of community conserved areas in Nagaland. They aim to ensure protection of endangered and threatened species like blight tragopone, hulog gibbon, the Chinese pangolin, and the great Indian hornbill in three selected landscapes in Nagaland. A lesser known Habitats grant partner, ReefWatch Marine Conservation, has been working on the rehabilitating coral reefs in the Andaman Islands. A lesser known species grant partner, Sayadri Nisarg Mitra, is working on the protection of world's most trafficked mammal, the Indian pangolin, through community participation in the Konkan region. Next. In its second edition in 2019, the Habitats Trust grants awarded a total of 70 lakhs to organizations. Our strategic partnership grant partner, Aranyak, have been working on restoring the habitat of the last surviving wild population of the pygmy hogs. Their project aimed to secure and recover Manus grasslands and its threatened species. Our lesser known habitat grant partner, Coastal Impact, has been working on coral transplantation, aids for prevention of coral patches off the coast of Goa. Our lesser known species grant partner, the Metastring Foundation, has been assessing the conservation status and needs of the Malabar tree toad through citizen based field surveys. And lastly, our conservation hero grant partner, Ms. Niti Mahesh, has been working on reviving traditional knowledge to restore the riparian habitat along the Kaveri River in the Kool District in Karnataka. 
next. Last year, we awarded 70 lakhs to dedicated conservationists. We have the Corbett Foundation who are working on conserving and recovering the Great Indian Buster. Seeds Trust is working along with tribals to conserve the Ayalur habitat and its biodiversity in Tamil Nadu. We have Bat Conservation India Trust who are working towards preventing the polar leaf nose bat. And lastly, we have Mr. M. Suraj, who's conducting anti-snare walks in protected areas of Chhattisgarh to curb poaching. To give you a brief idea about their work, you can check the videos that we will be now playing. Mm -hmm. With just 150 birds recorded worldwide, the great Indian bustard is on the brink of extinction. In India, the Kutch district of Gujarat is one of the last viable habitats, though only an all-female population of six individuals remain here. Their protected habitat in Kutch is limited to just two square kilometer, so these birds rely on the community grasslands of more than 40 villages in the area for their survival. The Corbett Foundation, which has been working to conserve the bustard in India, proposes to secure Great Indian Bustard habitats in Kutch by engaging the local communities residing within a 220 square kilometer radius of the core bustard habitat through awareness and capacity building programs for better grassland management. The forests of Ayalur in Tamil Nadu are a lifeline for the communities that live alongside these forests and depend on them for their livelihoods. They're also home to an elusive and threatened primate, the great slender loris. Anthropogenic usage beyond the natural regeneration capacity has degraded these forests, affecting both species diversity and tribal livelihoods. Seeds Trust has been working in Ayalur for over two decades with the vision of enabling local communities to become self-reliant and to conserve natural resources. Under the project, Seeds Trusts aim to reduce pressures on the Ayalur habitat by providing training to the communities on sustainable harvesting and cattle grazing methods. The rare and endemic Kola leaf nose bat is found today in only one cave of Kola district of Karnataka, where their numbers have decreased to just 150 to 200 individuals. Change in land use, stone quarrying, and rampant hunting for perceived medicinal purposes are driving these bats closer to extinction. Lack of information about the species is a major hurdle to conservation efforts. Bat Conservation India Trust has proposed an in-depth research to understand the behaviour and ecological needs of the Kola leaf nose bat so that necessary steps can be taken to protect them. Snares used by both organised poaching syndicates and local hunters pose a grave threat to wildlife in the protected areas of Chhattisgarh, which is among the hotspots for hunting and wildlife trade in India. For the past nine years, M. Suraj has been working alongside authorities in Chhattisgarh to curb poaching and sensitize the community on the need to protect biodiversity. Under the project, he proposes to conduct anti-snare walks in hunting zones and train frontline forest staff and local community champions on anti-snaring activities. Thank you, Deepak. You can also visit our YouTube channel to check out these videos and many more about our past recipients. Coming to the eligibility for the grants. Next. Due to time constraints, I will only be able to go through this briefly. We strongly recommend you visit our website and study the grant guidelines to, to thoroughly understand the eligibility criteria for the different categories. This will also help you determine what is the best category suited for the project and you, will, you would like to propose. Please note that each grant category has been designed to address a specific conservation need of the country. To begin with, the Strategic Partnership Grant is primarily for mid to large size field work oriented organizations who have an annual expenditure of at least 50 lakhs. 
The organization also must have completed five years of functional existence by March 2021 to be eligible to apply under the category. The grant is directed towards catering to the running costs of on-ground projects and also to create a two-way partnership between the Habitats Trust and the organization. The lesson on Habitats grant is designed to pay attention to overlooked or unaddressed unaddressed habitats across India that need urgent conservation attention and care. And through this grant, we hope to bring these vital overlooked habitats into spotlight. To apply in this category, the organization must have completed two years of functional existence before March 2021. Our next category, the Lesser Known Species Grant, aimed to provide conservation support to various lesser known endangered species of flora and fauna in India. You can have a look at our grant guidelines to get an idea of the indicative list of these species or the species you would like to propose to protect should be listed as threatened or data deficient as per the IUCN red list or on schedule one of the Wildlife Protection Act of India. While a lot of attention is bestowed upon the charismatic species of the country, such as tigers, lions, leopards, rhinos, etc., this grant aims to bring species that are equally endangered and ecologically important, but unfortunately not well known into the spotlight. The organization applying for this category must have completed two years of functional existence by March 2021. Mm -hmm. Lastly, the Conservation he uh, Hero Grant aims to champion the work of grassroots individuals, conservationists working dedicatedly with little to no support to protect India's biodiversity. The grant provides them a platform to expand their activities and garner further support for their work in conservation. While this grant is open to all individuals, it is important to know that these individuals should not be full-time employees or board members of any registered not-for-profit entity in India. Besides this, it is important to note that the projects that engage the local communities in their efforts will be given preference and organizations applying must be registered not-for-profit entity in India, that is society, trust, section eight, company or a registered institute under section 35.1.2. Again, I would like to mention that you should carefully read all grant guidelines given on our website before applying. Next. Now we come to the evaluation process. Next. Listed here are the key evaluation criteria basis which your application would be evaluated. It is very important to keep these factors in mind while designing your project and writing your proposal. The first one, problem statement. This should justify the need of the proposed project, taking into account the on-ground reality and existing conservation efforts in the proposed location. Then we come to relevance. Does your proposed project address key conservation issues taking into account the context of the project location that is population distribution, habitat cons conservation and existing or upcoming threats, wildlife population, involvement of stakeholders, etc. Then we come to methodology. Is there a pragmatic methodology to achieve the proposed objectives? Is there, a, is there sufficient portion of the budget dedicated to carrying out of the project activities? Are the activities or methodologies well thought out and based on experience or research? Then we come to expected conservation impact. How strong is the expected on-ground impact of the proposed project? And are there any measures or indicators in place to assess the impact of the projects? Then we come to monitoring, evaluation, and documentation. How do you plan to monitor your project on an ongoing basis? Then we come to stakeholder engagement. Does the project reach out to key stakeholders such as the forest department, enforcement agencies, local communities, farmers, students, etc. Sustainability, do you have a long-term strategy behind a proposed project? And does your proposal have a component of sustainability? Do you have strong fundraising skills? Does the proposed project fall into the current conservation context, enabling you to further the work? Then lastly, coming to rep replicability, can the project be replicated on a large or small scale while based at different locations? Also beyond this, you will also be evaluated upon your capacity to deliver your project and similar past experience. Next. Now we come to our last slide. In this last slide, we will talk about the evaluation process of the Habitats Trust grants. The recipient of grants are selected through a structured, robust and very transparent process. The first round is the first level screening and shortlisting. Successfully submitted applicants and projects will be screened for eligibility, relevance of answers, and authenticity of information. A team of experts, including sector specialists and external auditors, evaluate the successful entries, after which 28 shortlisted applicants move to field level verification. In the field level verification round, the Habitats Trust team visits the project sites of shortlisted applicants who are screened further for relevance and expected impact of the proposed project. Basis this, qualitative and quantitative scores are assigned to each applicant. 
In the third round, the sub-jury panelists shortlist three applicant, applicants in each category and also keep in mind the field verification scores. Another level of due diligence is conducted at this stage by our grant audit partners, after which in the last stage, the applicants present their proposed projects to the Habitats Trust grants jury. Well, that's all from my side. Please let us know if you have any queries in the Q&A section or email us directly. You can also log into our website to know more about us. Thank you, everyone. Over to you, Pooja. Thank you, Sunaina, for that comprehensive description. The Indian subcontinent, owing to its unique biogeographic position, has a range of habitats that harbor diverse and endemic flora and fauna. Climate change, deforestation, unhindered poaching, and other man-made problems have all resulted in fewer species today than there, that should, there should have been. Although the powerful Bengal tiger, the charismatic Asiatic lion, the fierce rhino, and the gentle giant's Indian elephants get most of the attention, there are many other seriously endangered species, poached and ignored, that are on the brink of disappearing for good. To talk more about the importance of protecting the lesser known species and habitats in our country, next up, we have a scintillating panel discussion that you've all been waiting for. I would like to invite Ms. Bahardat to moderate this discussion on saving the lesser knowns in India. Conservation biologist and environmental journalist, Bahardat has won over 12 national and international awards for her reportage on environmental issues. While working as a broadcast journalist, columnist, and environmental editor with CNN News 18, she reported from the most remote regions across the world, covering stories on climate change, biodiversity, and local communities, even going undercover for investigative reports. She is the author of Green Wars, Dispatches from a Vanishing World, uh, world published by HarperCollins, and Rewilding in India, uh, published by Oxford University Press, and has written various environmental news columns for Live Mint. She has been featured in Vogue India, Verve Magazine, and Al Gore's documentary on climate change and inconvenient truth. Her brave, heart-hitting journalism has had a direct, tangible imp impact on conservation in, in, in India. Joining us in discussion are our speakers, Ms. Nayantara Jain from Reefwatch Marine Conservation, she was also the grant recipient of Lesser Known Habitats grant in 2018 by the Habitats Trust. About eight years ago, Nantara came to Andamans and Nicobar Islands, and it changed her forever. She couldn't let go and go back, so she quit her job in Mumbai and decided to be there for good. A little after that, she began working as a scuba instructor and exploring the coral reefs every day. Then in 2011, she witnessed a mass bleaching event Live colorful reefs thriving with, with fish turned into fields of dull algae covered rubble graveyards almost overnight. That's when she found her calling. She realized she wanted to spend the rest of her, uh, her life working to protect coral reefs and the ocean environment in India. Nantara left the islands to obtain her master's degree in marine biodiversity and conservation from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography to equip herself with the practical and theoretical knowledge needed to do so, and came back immediately after to work with Reefwatch Marine Conservation and achieve her goal. Next, we have Mr. Parag Deka, Program Manager at Aranyak, grant recipient of the Strategic Partnerships Grant in 2019 by the Habitats Trust. Since 1997, Parag has been in, in, involved with the Pygmy Hawk uh, Conservation Program, a collaborative program working for the conservation breeding habitat restoration and reintroduction of critically in endangered pygmy hawk in India, particular, particularly in Assam since 1996. He began his career as project officer, PHCP, and was engaged in veterinary support, healthcare management, and breeding of captive hawks. Later, as project manager, he became involved in habitat restoration, reintroduction, and monitoring of the reintroduced hawks, in addition to the previous responsibilities. Since 2018, he has been responsible for leading the program as project director. Next, we have Mr. Rajesh Puttaswamya from Bad Conservation India Trust. He also won the grant, uh, he was also the grant recipient of Lesser Known Species Grant in 2020 by the Habitats Trust. Mr. Rajesh, Rajesh is a corporate lawyer and citizen scientist by passion. He is, he is the founder trustee of Bad Conservation India Trust, which has been at the forefront of protecting India's bats and their habitats. He has been actively involved in natural history, activities like research, wildlife photography, filming, 
conservation for over two and a half decades. He also writes to various magazines and online media to disseminate information to the public. He has been focusing on bats since 2011 and spends all of his free time driving the objectives of BCIT. We welcome you all. Over to you, Ms. Bahar. Thank you so much, uh, Pooja. Thank you, Sunena. Wonderful presentations and thank you, Pooja, for that very eloquent introduction. Um, I, I just like to apologize for joining late. I was on another webinar, such is the state of our lives today. But uh, welcome to all the 151 participants who are joining us from different parts of the country. We're delighted to have all of you here. We're going to have a whirlwind uh, talk over the next 20 minutes. I promise it's going to be exciting because imagine we're going to travel to the Andamans. We're going to look at bats. And then we're going to go to Northeast India to look at the tiniest pig in the world. I mean, how exciting is that? Uh, even though it's through, you know, our screens, but, you know, all these three speakers are such brilliant speakers. They're brilliant conservationists. So I'm really excited about this. I'm going to start with Rajesh, uh, with you, Rajesh, because I think you have the most challenging species to deal with in the time of Corona. Uh, because many Absolutely. people think that bats spread corona, they're the cause of the virus. Um, so, you know, given the times that we live in, uh, not just corona, prior to that also, I think, uh, you know, bats were, uh, were, uh, were very much uh, maligned uh, because people think it's bad luck or, you know, you shouldn't have bats uh, in your backyard. So, <clears throat> Rajesh, how challenging is it to conserve lesser known species and how do you deal with that in the work you do? Yeah, very valid point, um, Bharat. Thanks a lot uh, for highlighting this uh, challenge that we face. Uh, you know, of course, bats uh, are definitely quite a challenge, but uh, broadly looking at Indian landscape in terms of conservation, you know, other than the charismatic species, most other species have been ignored and uh, more so with the nocturnal species uh, uh, or the uh, smaller mammals, I would say. Uh, and bats obviously, are not just ignored, but also marred with myths and negativity. Uh, you talk to any elders in a family or kids uh, and ask them what they know about bats. Uh, if they talk, if they know anything about bats, probably it's going to be only negative about bats, not even a single point about positive about bats. That's the state we are in with respect to bats. And obviously it's quite challenging to kind of overcome that um, perception because Major, I would say, in if I had to say something about the challenge about bats, I think the major challenge that we face is fighting the perception perception of people towards bat. I think if we overcome that, the rest becomes quite easy. Uh, I guess that's the first step that we always try to kind of address when it comes to conservation actions. Uh, then the secondary, with the lack of information, lack of data, we don't even know or we have not even documented many species. We don't even have photograph about certain species of bats in India. And how do you talk to policymakers? How do you talk to people about conservation if you don't even know how the species looks like? That's one of the biggest challenges we face. So perception and then lack of information is two major challenges, I would say. Yes, perception and lack of information and how actually the two are tied together because even within science, it's it sounds yeah. hard to uh, you know hear that with all the technology in the world, we still there are still species we haven't photographed. Uh, you know, I mean, it, that comes as a shock to me. <laughs> so can you give us a, one or two examples of such species about which nothing is known? Sure. Uh, for example, this cola leaf nose bat itself, which we have, for which we have won the grant from Habitat Trust, uh, the only photograph I had seen uh, about them was in 2014 when a couple of researchers, like Dr. Bhargavi Srinivasulu and a team from Osmani City, carried out a research and captured a photograph. Until that time, there was not even a single photo of this species. Which is discussed. This bat was described in '94 until '94 to 2014. Not a single photograph of the bat. Imagine that. And there are many more species which had which are not been documented. For example, Hipposus durgadasi. Again, there is no photograph of this until uh, Dr. Bargavi discovered in Kolar, uh, which was known to be found only in Jabalpur in Madhya Pradesh. Now we found in Kolar as well, which is almost like 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers away. Yeah. So. That's another challenge. So there are many other species for which we don't have a uh, photograph and there are a few species which have been described in, say, in last 10 years, there are at least about eight or 10 species of bats which have been described. Mm -hmm. And there are many more cryptic species which are yet to be assessed and then described clearly. Mm 
Okay, so Rajesh, thank you for laying out the challenges. Yes, there are serious challenges there. I'm going to come to each one of you to understand the challenges. And in the second round, what we'd like to understand uh, is how you overcame those challenges, especially for people who want to apply for these grants. They would like to understand the process and yeah. how to go about your work. So Nentara, I'd like to come to you now from species to ecosystems and habitats, lesser known habitats. Uh, you know, uh, we tend to forget that India, we look at India just as, uh, you know, uh, from the from a very land centered point of view. And I think we tend to forget our marine ecology, our rich biodiversity, and the work that you do in, in protecting coral reefs, you're actually rebuilding coral reefs from what I remember, uh, you know, from the grant uh, that the Habitats Trust has given to you. So take, walk us through, you know, lesser known habitats. How challenging is that? Yeah, so I mean, when it came to coral reefs specifically, actually, um, I found that in, in the beginning, it was really hard uh, even to figure out whether I should be applying under the lesser known habitats uh, section or the lesser known uh, species section, right? Because these are uh, at simultaneously, they are, uh, you know, they are species, they are animals, but at the same time, they create this habitat for a third of all marine species. So, um, so that was my first sort of, um, you know, uh, <laughs> point of confusion. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, I think, you know, uh, it's it's also it's like you said before there's such a terrestrial focus not just uh you know uh amongst uh say wildlife uh magazines and things like that but also like with the government also with uh with our education system uh when it comes to india's wildlife that uh, initially, it was quite difficult. You know, I, I, I've had to even uh, speak to uh, forest department officials uh, and halfway through the meeting where they were like, I don't understand why are you here in my office? I'm in charge of forests. <laughs> you know? So, so even uh, a lot of the people whose jurisdiction it falls under are not aware of it. So I think that that was definitely quite a challenge. A second challenge was, you know, when you're talking about uh, my project specifically, because it was in the Andamans, um, again, a lot of people, it, it might sound bizarre to uh, the people who are here who are maybe more aware about things, but a lot of them didn't even know that it's part of India. Uh, and even when it is that it's because it's so far away, um, you know, when it came to other modes of funding, like, uh, say, CSR or other uh, things like that, for a lot of them, they are looking for projects that are much more visible, much more on the mainland, where their offices are, where maybe their people can participate. So these are some of the challenges. And then when you're talking about underwater, that adds a sort of extra layer because uh you know most people in india don't know how to swim a lot of people don't at least and are definitely scared of the ocean and i must uh you know i'm not really i think that's changing now slowly luckily but um it it was definitely um an issue so i think so those were some of the uh, some of okay. the challenges i faced not just you know when it comes to fundraising like i mentioned but also when it came to just getting the permits getting permissions to be there getting permits to handle these species uh with like i said a lot of the officials not even knowing that these species are and then not knowing what to do not wanting to touch it because you know they weren't sure yeah. um yeah and and again with any of these like you mentioned with bats you know visibility it's hard to when when people can't see them uh you know when there's less of a connect then it becomes much harder to get people to be interested or to care so I think, uh, Nentara, you raise a valid point, because if uh, you have to get CSR funding, then that means that uh, the, the officials need to learn how to dive and go and see, you know, those corals that you're protecting. So that's, I guess, an additional skill set they need to have. But mm -hmm. we'll come back to how you uh, countered those challenges. Parag yeah. Dekha, uh, I've actually, again, I've had the privilege to see your work, to see you in the field. And you're really on the intersection between lesser known species and also lesser known habitats. Because again, most people in our country don't know that grasslands are also endangered. And, you know, I think the pygmy hog, again, uh, you know, a truly an indicator and an iconic species for grasslands. So what are the challenges which you face, Parag? So we are working with the species uh, in the last 25 years and I'm going to complete my 24th years next week. 
and the species uh, the dalil is working with the species since 1971 and we are still struggling with the uh, conservation issues and primary uh, challenge is with the habitat the habitat is keep on changing from grassland to woodland it's a part of natural process second challenge is uh, people anthropogenic pressures on the grassland and if we consider specifically on manas manas suffered uh, a socio political unrest for about 18 years and that enter uh, period the enter protection mechanism was uh, really really gone down to zero and it create and it enhanced the whole degradation of habitat so primary challenge for the species is a degradation of habitat and and also at this moment still we don't have the uh, your best practice guidelines how we can really manage this successional habitat to uh, not only protect the species pygmy hawk but other uh, grassland dependent species and also this primary habitat i think that's primary challenge for uh, us sorry i just realized i was uh, on mute so i actually realized that the three of you have covered three very separate issues and yet they are so central to conservation one is superstition the lack of awareness about a species the other is perhaps a lack of ability to swim uh, or also perhaps to you know to see the the the, the threatened ecosystem and as dr decker just uh, just emphasized it politics you know the fact that manas had a huge insurgency issue but manas is now recovering um so i think all of these are uh, very important when it and it also proves that conservation is not just you know going out there practicing your science but it's also about you know learning to work with people which brings me to my second question which is that obviously in a country like ours we need to work with communities and i find that most biologists now accept that but it's still um, it's still i would say not central to their project it comes as an afterthought or it comes as okay we may we 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 could perhaps also do this uh, there's a very welfare approach to working with communities so i'd like to ask each one of you how do you work with the communities in your project and how central are they to what you do so starting with you nentara yeah um so a lot of uh, you know this again this i mean i'm i keep coming back to this not being able to swim and uh, having the skills that you need to sort of get into the sea um so in fact even before we started our uh, you know the reef restoration project even before that became uh, was even a thought in our heads uh, the first thing that i actually uh, started doing with reef watch when we went to the andamans was actually working with communities right and this this was my first the thing because the thing that really drove me i think towards conservation and the thing that i felt was really missing was that i uh, you know as a fairly privileged urban um at that point a child uh, got to go to the andamans um and explore it in a way that made me fall in love with nature uh, as a whole you know i got to go swimming and kayaking and diving and snorkeling and 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 that's what led to this whole journey of mine um and i realized that that most of the local children there uh, or the local adults don't get to experience any of this right uh, so the first project that we started and that we ran for many years before we got into even any kind of species or habitat conservation was to get all of these people to teach them how to swim to take them diving and that is what slowly evolved into this reef restoration project right and so we've always had them sort of involved through the whole thing even today um you know we have i have we have four people who are working full time on the project uh, out of that two of them are actually from the andamans and are through this whole uh, through this program that we ran before as well um and i think it's really critical because if you don't have that then your project runs into a lot of trouble you know your things uh, i mean we really rely on the we we trust the people who are around there to uh, that they'll tell us if there's a big storm coming up so that we can move our panels so that you know a lot of 
more on the ground field information that they are just, uh, you know, people who've been living there and fishing there for many years are just more informed about. So I think um, that sort of local community involvement has been a, is been a part of uh, our project even before the project was actually formalized. Yeah, I, in fact, that's something I noticed also as a, as a jury member when you were presenting to us, I yeah. do remember that uh, fishermen were central to your project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Parag, how would you bring communities in? I know it's a huge challenge in Assam, especially because those are also the communities that are using the thatch uh, from the grassland. So how do you overcome that conflict, if I can call it that, between humans and uh, the species there? After working with the communities like in one year with the Habitat Trust grant, what we realized that, or what we also we understood it before, is people living around the park they have a connections with the grassland from many, many, many years ago. But we are just after, after the protection mechanisms came up, or we, what you call, you know, after the declaration of the wildlife sanctuary or national park, we just put a barrier. I think that model is not going to work. We need to really, really evaluate that model yes. and really, really need to understand what the next model can be. Yes. We need to yes. really reconnect with the people with the habit diversity of the Manas National Park. So we are working towards that. We try to reconnect with the people, with the nature, try to make them understand what is the value of that Manas for their sustainability. So perhaps- I think that's a valid point, yes. yes. I mean, the fences and fines approach, uh, we have to move beyond that. And how do we do that? Uh, is again, you know, perhaps. yes, so that, that's why we need to really understand uh, their values, uh, their, uh, their uh, understanding towards the grass, uh, the forest. Also, our, our, our requirement, the requirement of the forest department. Maybe uh, three of us, we can some point of time join together and find a new model of managing the park. We should not blame each other. So that, that day is already passed. So we need to think about a new way of uh, handling people's uh, perspective or people's uh, angle to manage species and the habitat. Yes. So we have a number of questions coming in. Can I just remind all participants, please just type in your questions and we'll take them shortly. Rajesh, uh, uh, for this round, final words to you, how uh, are communities important for the conservation of bats and how do you go about it in your work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think any of us can achieve conservation without involving the community. In fact, we are only a catalyst. Ultimately, the people in the local community is going to kind of protect it. So we're only bringing expertise and subject matter knowledge and then maybe facilitate in some aspect of it. But the in the long run, it's the community who is, who is going to protect it. Okay, that's how I would see any conservation action. Now, uh, one I mean, couple of learnings that we had was uh, while we've been working with the community, wherever we're working on, for example, the Kola leaf nose bat, we started having a dialogue with the community, uh, talk to them, understand the challenges, everything. But uh, one of the key learnings that I had was, uh, I was always being not so close to people with the political uh, domain and used to keep them away. Uh, but what I realized is in the recent outreach program that we conducted, we just connected with the village folks and the school and the staff. Uh, but not invited one of the village panchat member or the so-called drum panchat member and who kind of get crashed or <laughs> and then came uh, around uh, and did participate in the event. But uh, one learning from that was it's important to educate even the politicians uh, and should not have any apprehension about their thoughts because ultimately they have a pull power because they might be able yeah. to kind of influence the community uh, in, in, in a positive manner. So, um, it, it is very critical, critical, critical for us to kind of take them along, make them aware, bring them, uh, and then obviously they need to kind of take credit because one of the complaints that they made was like, why well, you guys didn't involve us in this event when right. we would have got you more people and then they took the credit, but it's fine. As long as the work is getting done, if someone takes the credit, we are okay with that. Uh, but obviously it's important to get every stakeholder, whether it's a religious community, whether it's a political community, whether it's a uh, just the villagers or people who got affected, I think we have to take them all together. Uh, yes. it's, it's not going to be easy task, but in an important aspect that we have to find a fine balance. 
you raise a very fine point rajesh because i think we we only think in silos again we think communities yes. okay perhaps tribals or indigenous groups but we don't think that even you know politicians or the local mla perhaps could be a stakeholder True. so i uh, just want to add one point yes. here uh, especially with the kola leaf rose bat yes. you know uh, here there were almost about 100 plus family who which got affected with their livelihood uh, when we tried to kind of when it was stopped uh, so there was always a possibility of retaliation but one of the ways that we are trying to kind of work around with that challenge is try to instill pride in the people saying that this is the only bat which is found in their village not anywhere else in the world and they should have that ownership to protect the species so that way we are seeing positivity in the people especially in the young community while the older ones still are cribbing about losing their livelihood but of course they have moved on they are having alternate livelihoods now but at least the younger generation feels pride about having this rare species found in their locality yes so translating that sense of pride into actual livelihoods absolutely that's what needs to be done all yes. right we're at 5:45 right now we have 15 minutes I'm, what i'm going to request each one of the panelists now uh, you have all received uh, the habitats trust grant so how about sharing you know that one secret ingredient you know there are people listening in who might want to apply for the grant so perhaps on your engagement with the habitat trust could you share one or two tips or pointers on in terms of what is it that they can include uh, you know in their um, application which would help um, i am not going to say anything on this because i am also a jury member so i'm going to desist from commenting but i'm only going to ask the question so just share with us some a few tips for our participants who would want to apply so nantara starting with you Okay, so I would um, I'm going to say this based on some of the conversations I had later with um, you know uh, two of the um, with some of the Habitat Trust people uh, after I got the grant. But I was told that one of the things that uh, you know uh, that stood out in my application was. um that um you know that i i mean i don't know if this is the best advice but i didn't write it as a scientist right so i wrote it as um someone who's passionate about protecting coral reefs that knows a little bit about them and i really tried to tell that story and uh explain its importance and um you know in as simple terms as people might be able to understand especially people that are not uh, you know marine biologists so i think that might be a, a an a nice piece of advice like remember especially when you're looking at lesser known species and habitats i mean not everyone might you know have the same sort of knowledge that you do but what's uh, really critical is can you translate that passion and the importance can you bring that across to anybody who's passionate about wildlife so that would be my uh tip okay rajesh would any tips any hot tips you would like to share uh i think one important tip i would like to share is uh, be transparent uh when it's very critical to share information what uh, the team who is applying for grant knows very clearly they should not cook up any uh, information so try and be as transparent as possible uh, and then it's ideally or important to kind of have worked on that particular habitat or species of nf insight about it do your homework thoroughly and then try and work on it and if you just try to hit a stone say okay, okay let me also apply for this grant i mean apply for the grant but that's not going to work you need to have done your homework thoroughly you should have enough information about the species of the habitat and have structured or planned in a such a manner that you know what is going to work what is not going to work what is going to be successful what is not going to be successful and how are you going to address that if you have these answers i think uh, it's probably easy to get through okay so that's interesting again parag any anything you would like to share i think uh, the the applicants should have a compass they should have a what compass a compass yes okay that's interesting <laughs> <laughs> okay otherwise you are going to give us you are going to give us a, a funding if you don't have a, a road map is it is a vast world yeah, and thousands of applicants will be there and you really need to tell that that is your path and that you're going to follow your path you believe on your path you know follow your path and you're going to as if whatever you need to have a proper uh, mne system and a pump pump and a compass so that you, their compass can take you through following the path and secondly 
individual matters. You need the people, individuals who can really, really take you forward, take the lead the whole team. Yes, yes. And third also, uh, I think organization matters. You need to really have a backup of a strong organization. Yeah. Without or good organizations, system or, or backup or a good individuals and without the compass, you cannot run a project. I okay. think that, that's, that's my okay. take. Very, very good suggestions there. You, you need a compass, you need a strong organizational backing, uh, you need compassion, you need the right information. I hope that this discussion has helped, uh, you know, people who have logged on here. And I hope you have learned about, you know, endangered ecosystems, lesser known habitats. There's so much to learn from the experience, in, uh, you know, with the people in this room. So I'm going to stop here. What I'm going to request Pooja to do now is there are questions related to the panelists. So Pooja, if you could ask those questions, please. And then perhaps we can get the panelists to respond. Thank you so much, uh, Bahar. That was indeed a wonderful discussion. And we have a couple of questions here in the Q&A section. However, due to paucity of time, we'll be able to take only one or two. Uh, one question is for Ms. Nantara. Uh, recently, I, uh, this is uh, by uh, Munazir Bhatt. Recently, I watched a program on TV where marine scientists used cement hollow blocks as artificial reefs, and they, sh uh, they showed it was very helpful. My question is that, have you tried artificial reefs, and what is the impact on the ocean ecosystem? Yeah, so we, uh, I mean, yeah, my our whole project was about artificial reefs, so definitely uh, we have done them. Uh, the reason we uh, chose metal is that we specifically wanted to use the mineral accretion system, which is basically where you uh, you know, attach, give your artificial reef a low voltage of electricity and through mineral accretion, it helps the corals grow a lot faster. So you can, you know, look up this technology and uh, read a lot about it online. Um, so uh, for that particular purpose, uh, hollow blocks wouldn't work because of course they don't conduct electricity. Uh, but that being said, underneath our structures, we did put a lot of hollow blocks later uh, just to kind of create the sort of complex habitat that natural coral reefs have to give a lot of fish places to hide and, um, you know, uh, just like they would on the natural reef. And that actually helped to increase our, uh, the biodiversity on our uh, artificial reefs a lot. So that was really helpful. The only one thing that we did and that I would suggest, I mean, not that anyone can just go around putting cement into the ocean, but if you were going to do that uh, as part of your project, uh, the cement does need to be cured for so it needs to be kept in uh, water uh, for a long time, uh, you know, so that it doesn't leach any of its chemicals um, into the ocean later. So, yeah, I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Nantara. There is another question asked by an anonymous, uh, anonymously. What kind of awareness campaigns have worked well in the past for conservation of such species or habitats? Something that is simple yet effective? Sorry, who was this for? Uh, there is no, any one of you can answer. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Sure. Uh, what kind of awareness campaigns have worked well in the past for conservation of such species and habitats that is lesser known species and habitats? Something that is simple yet effective. Okay, uh, that's too general a question. Uh, yeah. uh, Pooja, can we take a, something else? Because there's some very specific uh, questions. Sure. Which are sure, there is another question by Sanjoy. Is burning of grasses as management practice harming the grassland species, including pygmy hog? Yeah. It is, uh, it, it is how you use the use the, the tools. You see, if you use the tools, that is the tools of managing the grassland, no doubt about that. But there should be a proper way to using that tools. And we are trying to designing or try to teaching the management manage, managers how to use that tools. So there is a question of uh, uh, breeding season of different species. So what I found from our study that if we, there is a very narrow gap between 15th of uh, January or end of January to like end of February. That is the specific time if you use the fire, uh, perhaps it's going to effective for managing the species uh, habitat, also not damaging the other species. But if you do later on, it may have impact the uh, uh, breeding of different species or before. Also, 
if you uh, put a fire blocks and use a block burning that can also help in managing the uh, other species i mean, I mean. okay Okay, Paras, uh, thank you for that. There's another question to Reefwatch. Is Reefwatch still looking for ACE volunteer divers? Nayantara, do you need divers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, we're always, we love uh, welcoming volunteers to our different bases. Um, they can be divers, they don't have to be divers. Uh, and based on each person's skill set and how long they have to spare, we kind of uh, assign them to the right uh, projects and the right activities. So you can just send in an email on communications uh, at reefwatchindia.org and someone will definitely get back to you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Nantara, there's another question for you from Jatin Mathur. How can conservation be done in non-territorial waters or the high seas and the seabed? Most of the marine megafauna are migratory and travel long distances, which make high seas a place of significant priority, especially now given the direct and indirect impacts of climate change. So yeah, uh, yeah that's, no, that, that's I mean, that's quite a, a great valid question. One. That's yeah. a great question. Um, and unfortunately, there is no way because this is, I mean, it's just the legal uh, you know, framework of the world and all our countries that when it comes to non-territorial waters, there is literally, there's no one in charge, right? So that can only be done through either some radical measures. Um, you know, you can look up sea shepherds who are really radical ocean <laughs> conservationists who do their own thing on the high seas. But, um, uh, but really the only way is through awareness and through hoping that people will drive change. But a lot of these highly migratory species do have certain areas which are really critical to their life um, cycles for different ways. So breeding grounds, uh, you know, uh, grounds where uh, nesting grounds or mating grounds or um, so once these are uh, found out, then um, you know, often focusing conservation efforts for those species in those areas can be a really good way to, uh, you know, to help with those species. And then of course, yeah using trackers and other things like that, you can see what happens to them as yes. they go through yes. these high schools. And to build on that, we're also, India is a signatory to the Convention on Migratory Species. So that perhaps in terms of the law would also be valid. So, all right, uh, there are certain questions which are related to the Habitats uh, Trust grant application. People have questions about how can they apply, what would be valid. So I'm, gone, I'm going to, there's a question for me. <laughs> okay, uh, but what I'm going to do is, I'm so sorry, Mukund, we're out of time. Otherwise, I would have gladly answered that question. Um, I just want to thank my panelists, Nentara, Rajesh, and Parag. Thank you so much thank for you. sharing your pearls of wisdom with us. Uh, as I said, there are uh, one or two questions related to the grants application process. So I'm going to hand it over to Sunena, and she'll be able to answer those better. Sunena, thank you, over Bahar. to you. It was really thank nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, speakers, so much for that thought-provoking deliberation. Thank you, Bahar, for facilitating the session so well. I would now like to invite Sunaina and Tanya from the Habitats Trust to help us answer a few queries that we received in our last symposiums and also in the Q&A section and discuss a few frequently asked questions. We will also be joined by the audit partners, Grant Thornton Bhadrat team, for questions related to compliance and governance in the application form. I'd request participants to kindly use the Q&A function to type in any additional questions that you may have regarding eligibility, application form, application process, evaluation criteria, or anything else. I'm also going to put the link to the application form for you in the chat box here, along with a link to the application form walkthrough video for your perusal. Over to you, Sunaina and Tanya. Thank you, Pooja. Uh, we have some questions here. We frequently get asked by our applicants via emails and phone calls. So to start with, here are some commonly asked questions and Tanya will help us by answering them. The first one is, uh, can I include any other species that is not included in the 42 endangered species list mentioned in the guidelines? Uh, thank you so much, Sunana. Uh, I hope I'm audible to everybody. Uh, so yes, we do accept proposals on species apart from the 42 indicative species um, that have been provided in the, in the grant guidelines. Uh, however, these species must be listed as either data deficit, critically endangered or endangered as per the IUCN, or they should be on schedule one of the Indian Wildlife Protection Act. And also there should be a strong statement to support why you need to protect the species. Okay, the second question. 
uh, can I apply for conservation of flora slash plant species? Uh, absolutely, yes, you can. Uh, and we also have included a few floral species in our indicative list of species in our grant guidelines. Uh, can I apply for more than one grant? No, uh, no. Each year, you and your organization can only apply for one grant in one grant category and just like put in one application. Can I email slash post my application? Um, we only accept applications through our online portal. You can find the link in the chat box. It is uh, www.thehabitatstrust.org slash grants. Uh, however, we have had made some exceptions in the past. For example, internet shutdowns, disasters, or some climate emergencies that cause telecommunication outages. Uh, you can write to the Habitats Trust team at the Habitats Trust at hcl.com to check with us. Uh, in case uh, you have a genuine case, uh, we can make an exception and then you can send us your application offline. I work for I work for a for-profit company slash enterprise. Can I apply for Conservation Hero Grant? Uh, yes, absolutely. You can apply for the Conservation Hero Grant if you work for something uh, that has to do with for-profit or an enterprise. Uh, as per our grant guidelines, you cannot be a full-time employee or on the board of trustees or on the board of management committee of any not-for-profit entity registered in India. What is the difference between recommendations yeah. and references? Oh, yeah. So this is a question we get asked very often. Uh, recommendations are only applicable for individual applicants. That is the uh, for the conservation hero grant category. Uh, the recommendations can come from mentors or your thesis professors, anyone who is familiar with your educational background or qualifications or also your field in the uh, work in the field. And uh, on the other hand, references uh, should uh, technically come from people who understand your work on the ground or uh, relevant to the proposal that you're putting in. Uh, for example, if you're putting in a proposal to save turtles in Odisha, uh, the references should be from someone who's based there, someone who's familiar with your work and who can actually refer you and your work. I have applied for my not-for-profit registration certificates but have not received them as yet. Am I eligible to apply? Um, so to apply for the strategic partnership grant category, you must have all your documents in place before you apply. But for the lesson on habitat and lesson on species category, we're a bit more lenient. Uh, if you have applied uh, for your certificates, we can offer you time for a sub jury round to get the documents in place. And this is about six, seven months from the date you've put in your application. Uh, if by that time you're not able to acquire your uh, documents or certificates, uh, we will not be able to take your application forward. Can I apply for the same project applied for in previous grant cycles? Um, so if you have applied for a project in the previous grant cycles and you were unsuccessful, uh, yes, you can reapply for the same project again, uh, but it's important to understand why your first application was not taken forward. Uh, you can go back to our grant guidelines to see what could have uh, been the reason. You can also get in touch with us to understand why your application was not taken forward. Uh, if you put in the exact same application as, uh, as before, it's very likely that you will get an unfavorable result again. Uh, so Nana took you through some key valuation criteria during her presentation. Uh, please keep those in mind before applying when you're answering all the questions in the proposal. Can a professor or research scholar from an academic institution apply for the grant? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, if you work uh, at a government affiliated academic institute and have section 3512, you can apply for the grant as an organization. Uh, if you're part of a private institute, you can apply for the conservation hero grant at an individual capacity. Can a new non for profit organization apply for the grants for organizations? Uh, so we have three grant categories uh, for organizations. So a new not-for-profit can actually apply for the lesser known habitat or lesser known species grant. Uh, but for this, the organization must have completed two years of functional existence as, as per the registration certificate, functional existence, of course, in India, on or before 31st March 2021. The organization also must have at least two years of experience carrying out direct on-ground projects in conservation. Uh, 
Unfortunately, for the strategic partnership grant, uh, a new organization uh, might not be eligible to apply the org because for this category, the organization must have completed five years of functional existence and the organization must have had at least three years of experience carrying out on-ground direct projects. And also the organization must have had an annual expenditure of over 50 lakhs, including field expenses. Now we come to our last question. Can a research association or an institution apply for the grant? Yeah, so this uh, question actually links back to what we were talking about earlier regarding uh, professors. Uh, so if your organization comes under Section 3512, yes, you can apply for grants for organizations. However, if you're not a Section 3512 and you're a private institute, you're not eligible to apply for a grant for the organizational categories. Uh, in that case, you can apply as an individual or uh, that is the conservation hero grant. Thank you so much, Tanya, for such apt and prompt answers from your end. I would now like to invite Chirag from Grand Thornton Bharat to please help us address a couple of more queries regarding documentation and other processes required by the candidate. Uh, good evening, Svena. Good evening. Okay, the first one is, I do not have ADG slash 3512 slash 12A slash FCRA audited accounts. Can I apply for strategic partnership grant? Okay, uh, so uh, any applicant applying for strategic partnership grant must have registration under Section 12A, ATG, or Section 35, Clause 1, Subsection 2 of Income Tax Act, 1961, followed by the audited accounts for financial year 2019-20. Um, is renewal of 12A and ATG under new registration procedure under Section 12A mandatory for applying for the Habitats Trust grants? Okay, uh, so the... Uh, uh, there has been some extension. The timelines have been deferred to April 1st, 2021. Hence, the new provisions will be applicable for the financial year 2021-22. Okay, this one's a little more important. How do I register for my ATG and 12A certificate? Okay, uh, so there are two parts to it. If we consider registration under 12AA, that is the current process, uh, the applicant needs to log into the e-filing portal of Income Tax Department, that is Income Tax India, efiling.gov.in, wherein the applicant can access two forms that are 10A and 10G, which are required for registration under 12A and ATG respectively. Uh, the list of documents are, that needs to be submitted are also mentioned on the forms. Um, <clears throat> after the uh, application, form, uh, the, the forms are filed up, the person who is authorized to verify the return of income under section 140 as applicable to the SSE needs to verify it on the portal. And uh, from April 1st, 2021 onwards, uh, the registration will be under Section 12AB, which can again be accessed through the e-filing portal of Income Tax Department. Is FCRA registration mandatory to apply for the grants for organizations categories? Uh, no, since it's a domestic grant, FCRA is not uh, mandatory. Expenditure of more than INR 50 lakhs for strategic partnership grant should be pertaining to which financial year? So it should be pertaining to financial year 2019-20. Okay. And lastly, what financial documents are needed to apply for the Conservation Hero Grant? So an individual applying for Conservation Hero Grant must have a PAN card, Aadhaar card, bank statement, and proof of tax if applicable. Okay, that's all, Chira. Thank you so much for your insights on this. Um, there are some additional queries that have come in our live uh, Q&A, and I think Tanya has answered most of them in the section. Um, are there any... Okay, I think there are, what are the documents to be uploaded if I'm applying for organizational grants? Uh, yeah, this is one question that we can cover over here. So the documents that are mandatory or uh, to upload, they would be on the last page of your application form. Uh, that would be images, of course, of your projects, the registration certificate, the MOA bylaws or the 12-way certificate, the ATG certificate, uh, Section 3512 of the Income Tax Act, uh, then your PAN card, uh, your latest income tax return, and your most uh, recently financially audited accounts. Uh, so these are mandatory. What is ma not mandatory is the annual report and the FCRA certificate. And then also you can upload, uh, if you have received any media coverage, you can upload that, and then the declaration form that you will find on our portal itself. So these are the documents that you need to collect. 
Thank you so much, Tanya. Uh, that's all the time we have today for addressing your queries. I request everyone to send in any other query they have regarding the application process or the Habitats Trust grants on our email or call us on the Habitats Trust phone lines. Both have been shared by Pooja in the chat box. Thank you so much for your help, Tanya. That's all from us. Over to you, Pooja. Thank you so much, team, for addressing these queries. I hope the session has resolved most of the questions and concerns for the participants. If you have any more questions that may not have been answered today, do put them in the Q&A section now. Or you can also send, us, send it to us over email to kusum at csrbox.org, or you may send it to the Habitats Trust at hcl.com. Kusum from my team has, uh, has put both the email IDs and the phone number in the chat box here. With this, we come to a close for this year's symposium series. As we conclude our dialogue on the Habitats Trust Grants 2021, I would like to acknowledge and appreciate our esteemed speakers, Ms. Bahar Dutt, Ms. Nayantara Jain, Mr. Parag Deka, and Mr. Rajesh Puttaswamya, who took the time out of their busy schedules and provided us with such wonderful insights. We are truly humbled by your presence. Thanks, thank you once again. I would also like to extend my thanks to all of you for being such wonderful audience. I'd urge all of you to please apply for the grants. Please note that the last date for application is 31st March, that is coming Wednesday. Do read the grant guidelines carefully before you start with the application. We have also created an application walkthrough video for you as put in the chat box earlier. Thank you once again, and we wish you luck with your application process. Have a great day ahead. Thank you.